Dear Heavenly God, we thank you so much for bringing us all here together at the lunch. We thank you for the food that you provided, uh, both for our physical bodies and for our spiritual bodies. So we pray, Lord, that you will help us all to be alert, pay attention, and understand what you're teaching us through this message um, today. We pray that you will help us to, um, by reinforcing what we've already learned and understanding the little details and how um, we're supposed to understand. Please help us to let go of anything that would hold us back and grasp on the truth. Help us to hate sin and love your truth. And uh, we pray that you will bless all those who are listening and all those who are listening. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we are doing in God we trust. Okay, let me hit the slideshow. I meant to do that. Okay. So we're gonna do that. So this. Hold on. I'll figure it out. I will. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want this one. Okay. Can you see my cursor moving around? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was showing you the right screen. Okay. Let me open up the chat. Comments. Yeah, you use two computers when you do this, right? I have yeah. enough with one. Yeah. Well, I actually have three monitors because my laptop is open too. So because the the ca uh, camera is on the laptop, so I have to have that open. So I end up with three monitors. And so you have to be careful which one you put this thing on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I have trouble with doing all this with just one. <laughs> it does help um, for being able to view, like you, you just saw me drag the chat over. I could put the chat in a different screen and still be able to monitor that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Without, um, okay. okay, cool. All right. So here we are in God We Trust. And this was from the Hold the Rope Camp Meeting from Germany, December 2020 through January 2021. And this was, of course, Elder, Tuff, um, Elder sorry, <laughs> Elder Tess. And I was trying to put her last name in there somehow. It wasn't working for me. Um, so Elder Tess Lambert. Um, and this was on the day, December 30th, 2020. Okay. Okay, there we go. I'm not sure. Okay, there we go. All right. So, um, about a week ago, two documents were shared on the media broadcast. So this was back in December, right? The first one was how the Constitution became Christian, and the second is called Church and State in the Early Republic. It's the first document that's the focus of our attention. This one right here. Uh, the second document will help to give some context to the first. So what we're doing, what we're going to do is work through the first document and supplement that history with the other documents so we can build a broader picture of particularly even evangelical history. So our, our goal is to learn evangelical history, right? I say this at the beginning of every presentation, what we are teaching in these classes, in this class, is built directly upon what we have been studying since May. Through other camp meetings, and particularly the last presentation, it's all one continuing theme. If we weren't familiar with those presentations, this one will be much harder to follow. We are building on these present uh, on these studies and remember what we started with in May. Oops. What we started with in May was the Apis Bull, right? And so we're just building on that and continuing through the Vespers, still building on that. Okay, so um, the presentation she's um, the document she's referring to is how the Constitution became Christian, and that one's by Jared Goldstein. Okay. So I always try to begin by, by trying to show where we are on our reform line. So a little revision or review. So 1989, 2001, Sunday law, 
depends on what line we go on. This is Sunday Law for the Priest. Um, Sunday Law here on the big line, uh, close probation, second advent, right? That's the line of the 144,000. We know, uh, and we know where we are. Okay. Uh, that was back in 2020, right? December 2020. But we're also on another line of the priesthood here. The, um, this is the first fractal. And we discussed fractals a few weeks ago on a Sabbath series. We understand ourselves on this fractal to be in the time of trouble. So in here. Um, that's easy to imagine between the increase of knowledge and the formalization. But we're between the increase of knowledge and formalization on two reform lines. So um, so on the 144,000, we have the increase of knowledge and the formalization of the message. And we're in, um, at that time, we were right here in between those two. And on the priest line, we have the increase of knowledge and the formalization still right in between those two, right? Okay, so um, on two separate lines, if you trace the presentations, you can see them weaving between these two thoughts that we are bracing ourselves for two different distinct formalizations. Right? We stand here, heading towards the formalization of the priest for the second advent. And very soon after we reach the formalization that's designed to prepare us for the Sunday law. This increase of knowledge was particularly May to September this year. So she has right here, May to September of this year. And it is the Episcopal study. As that developed in Oceana between May and December. I mean, sorry, May and September. But it continues to grow to swell. Okay. Um, like I always tell you guys, um, if uh, you have any comments or uh, questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. Because, you know, if, you, if there's questions along the way, it's good to talk about them right then. Okay. So at the French camp meeting, the point was made that we have two institutions established in Eden two institutions God has had to reestablish before the next Eden, the Sabbath and marriage. There are two histories from modern Israel, Alpha and Omega. And what is happening is there is a reestablishment of the Sabbath in our Alpha history. So that was the Millerites, right? Alpha history. And a reestablishment of marriage in our Omega history. So if the Millerites had done their job properly, we would have understood the Sabbath, gone to heaven, sorted out marriage, or I'm sorry, sorted marriage out in a thousand years. So um, if we had, so basically if we had gone to heaven, then if they had done their job, then we would have been learning about marriage in heaven as opposed to here. But right now, because they didn't, we're learning about it here. We're learning about the gender here. But that didn't work, so we do it on earth. The Sabbath and marriage, twin institutions. So all of Adventism, looking at the Sabbath, in 2015, they decided not to ordain women, and at the same time, they opposed gay marriage. You can see they have an issue with marriage, and they're not doing well with the second institution. The same as ancient Israel, they grabbed hold of the Sabbath. That's their focus of attention when Christ comes back. In fact, they know this so well, they make sure that they kill him before the Sabbath starts, because you wouldn't want to break the Sabbath by killing God on it. So you're going to kill him on Friday, get all your work done before the sun sets. So you have this acceptance of Sabbath issue with marriage. Someone in the chat is talking about the thousand years. If someone doesn't think it's going to take a thousand years to sort out this problem, I would suggest inequality runs that deep. 
I'm at the point of thinking this is going to take a thousand years. I didn't think we'd be at this stage in two years. I thought many more people would get it. So I wouldn't be surprised by a thousand years. I hope that we're excited at the thought of how much we still have to learn. Entire subjects that perhaps God doesn't think we're yet, we're ready for yet. I said that to make one point, this increase of knowledge, this formalization is the training of the first group to go to work. And we're teaching people about marriage. So this subject of marriage is the key concept of the message in each history from the formaliz formalization, I'm saying that word right, formalization of the midnight cry to our increase of knowledge and formalization. And it will continue to be as we approach the Sunday law. This increase of knowledge from May to September, it's also important to be watching the studies in Wales. It was neither planned nor a coincidence that the theme of the studies in Wales have been on marriage from the beginning, addressing some practical issues connected with this message. And so we all remember that the studies she's referring to are the ones that Elder Parman did on, on marriage, right? Whether it's that series in Wales on marriage or the Apis Bull, we've been preparing for that thousand years. But the Apis Bull series started in with in May. It was meant to be a study that brought us to Millerite history. And it has done that. But I kept getting sidetracked because as we began in 1798, there were other themes that we were tracing. What began to happen was instead of focusing on Millerite history, we could see that there was a thread of Protestantism connecting 1798 to the present day. I'll describe it this way. When was the time of end? Um, time of the end. And that was 1798. So Ellen White is able to say, even when she's outside of the reform line, that she's in the time of the end. Elder Parmer, Mender, Elder Parmer has taught all of this. When you look at the time of the end, you can see it structurally as 1798 or as 1989. Dates that began a reform line, but the way you'll find Ellen White use that phrase is that the time of the end began in 1798 and extends all the way to the second advent. advent. So humanity has been so humanity has been in the time of the end since 1798. You can use it two different ways. Ellen White doesn't have visibility of Daniel 1140 Part B as being 1989. She has no visibility of World War II, let alone 1989. She's going to use that phrase as 1798 extending all the way to the second advent. So we can see structurally, but this progressive thought also makes sense. The time of the end does not start and then it ceases to be the time of the end. If 1798 is the time of the end and this is the second advent, then how can all of this not be the time of the end? Because otherwise, what end is it talking about? I'm going to use the second concept that we've been in the time of the end since 1798. Uh, this is the history that is prophetically loaded. The great, the second great awakening, Millerite history, the civil war, all the history leading up to World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. There is so much happening. The formation of the modern European countries, the fall of monarchy, the introduction of communism, all of these events occur 
in the time of the end. So you see, you see that she's um, and did a great job of it. Are you there or did you freeze? I think she froze. Are you guys there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes. So she must have froze. She'll be back. Still shows she's connected. Are you there, Christine? She's, she's frozen. She'll be right back. Got it. Thanks, Francisco. Okay, I'll try closing some stuff up. I'm telling you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I'm closing some things up. Okay. That'll make a difference. All right, let's see. So I finished reading this part. Let me close it up. Okay. So I finished reading this page, and I can't remember if you, I don't know if you heard me say that. Um, so the time of the end starts here, but it's not just here. It's not just here. The time of the end is from here all the way to the second advent. You guys can hear me again? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah we heard that part. Okay, and all great. those events that take place in between. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And before God gave us prophetic glasses, we would not have seen World War One or World War Two as having anything to do with a great controversy, which makes no sense. And as we understand this time of the end prophetically, we see that all of this has everything to do with the great controversy as both sides prepare for the end. To break down this history, this fight, God has given us different parabolic structures, different models to break down this history and help us make sense of it. Different structures with different themes to make different points. I want to give three brief examples we can look at this history of the time of the end and how we usually go to that history would be to say alpha history, the 1888 history, and omega history. That's all quite neat. Failure, failure, success. Egypt, Babylon, Rome. It's rock solid. And you see the interaction in these histories between Adventism and Protestantism, dealing with the issues of inequality in both the Alpha and Omega. It's, but it's not the only structure that God gives us to break down the time of the end. We have the lines of the counterfeit. So over this, we can see that Satan counterfeited the Alpha history attempting to, it took him until the 1888 history with the world wars and then 1888 to 1889. So this is 1888 with the, um, the world, world wars, then 1888 to 1889. And then our history from 2001. This is the counterfeit. So all of these are the counterfeit. So it's going to break down the time of the end even more. God is giving us more models to try and help us see the great controversy in the time of the end in the history since 1798. We won't be using either of those models in this camp meeting. The model that we use, that we will use was introduced last year and it was developed from our understanding of 2014 as midnight, midway, or midpoint. That would be this part. 
Uh, the title for those studies was called In God We Trust. And through two methods, a study was developed that highlighted the 1860s to 1900s time period, the 1940s and the 1950s, and 1979 to present. Okay, so I wanted to remind you that, so this presentation is called In God We Trust, but it's also, it's called In God We Trust Revisited. So back in um, this, so the, um, the presentation was done in God We Trust once before, but now we're revisiting that topic, okay? It was Brazil in 2019. Okay, thank you. Brazil in 2019 was in God We Trust, and now we're revisiting, thank you. Here we have the lines drawn out from In God We Trust. That was taught showing us the beginning of the national reform movement. We know what that led to. Next, the 1940s and, um, and, and 50s, and then 1979 to present. Got the 1940s. And yeah, not all of them were on the board that she was talking about there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean the exact dates anyways. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, we were taken to those three histories from using 2014 as midway and prophetic time spans. From 2014, the 151 takes us to the beginning of the national reform movement. And the 1963 takes us to the epicenter of the 1950s crisis. Okay, so let's look at that. So we've got from 2014, if you subtract 2014, uh, if you subtract 151 from 2014, it takes you back to 1863, right? And then this one, and that's the middle of the Civil War. And if you go back, if you subtract 151 from 2001, so 9-11, you get 1861 or I don't think that was an actual date. That's why the little asterisk is here. I'm trying to remember what she said on that. So 2001 minus 151. Um, it doesn't take you back to where it says there. And she makes that comment as to why she does it. She kind of used it as a symbolic one, I think, using events or something like that. Okay. That makes so maybe sense. she says it here. I can't remember. Well, I would imagine that the 1950s, I mean, sorry, 1850s, the 1850s here were all about slavery, which brought us to this point, right? Yeah. So she's pointed at here. It, it's she's talking about what brought it, the 18th, the as it says 1950s, but yeah, because it was because 2001. If you back that up, it takes you to 1850. Um, but I remember. I don't remember if she says it in here or what. But she kind of. That's why the asterisk is there. I actually you probably have to go back to the Brazil one to find out what she said. I think, um, but she marked it as a symbolic 151, and I don't remember everything she said about it. Okay. And that probably sounds confusing, but you have to go back and watch the video to see what she right. said. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think to do that. It was, it was a good idea. She said it wasn't an actual 151. Okay. But she, I think she took characteristics of it. But if you took 2001 and backed it up, 151, it actually takes you to 1850. Okay. Okay, cool. But then it says 1950s here, and then that's probably, so she's talking about this part in here, right. that 1950s crisis with, uh, with is this, World, well, World War One and World War Two. This is World War, this is after World War Two. Cold War. This is the Cold War. Yeah right here okay so the third uh, yeah that was the 63 she marks it 1956 there but the, if anybody remembers those studies and then she taught it someplace else after that well, something victor always remembered i can't remember where it was at where she taught it but she marked more than what we see here and she did it through maybe it was in brazil when she did midway or the midpoint one because she marked, you can see 1861 to 1865, the midpoint is 1863. We know that 2014 is midway. Um, and 
you see that on the actually on that chart too. The midway comes from underneath that where it's got the Millerite history, but she marked different midway points than what you see there, 52, 54, and 56. There were different ones that she marked. So I know that's confusing too, but it's in some of the other studies. Um, I don't know if this is where she settled on. Okay. I'm sorry. I know that sounds really confusing. <laughs> Well, I think I was making it a little bit more confusing because I'm trying to think of, I'm trying, trying to make this 1863 because that's where that ends up, right? But oh. what she's talking about right here is this. The 63 years, correct. So my bad, so. Oh, okay, which is, a, which is what? What's the 63? It was a symbol from what? Well, she says it takes us to the epicenter of the, 18, the 1950s crisis, but I, don't, I do not remember. Like that was the, the 63 was a symbol of the 120, a half of 126, which is a symbol right. of the 2520. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Okay. So um, this might bring up questions for anybody. So uh, if you have any questions, we can work them out. So is everybody good with this? I probably made it more confusing, sorry. No, it's not. Um, you, you wrote it down the way the way she said it. A, so this is good. See, the third model, I'm sure there are more. Uh, the third I've mentioned today is this model that highlighted three time periods where there was an evangelical movement to change the United States, to mobilize political power, and whatever came of that, we may tend to think of that, it's just being a Sunday law. That's interesting, the word she used there, that to mobilize political power. And what were we talking about earlier, what happens with the Democrats, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the election, in the 2020 election where they thought they had won, what did they actually lose? They lost their power. They lost their power. So she's talking about this mobilizing the threat. They mobilize the political power. And that's what McConnell's been doing is mobilize that political power. And the Democrats don't have it. I don't think I'd play chess against that person. <laughs> you what? Is that I wouldn't play chess with um, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So this is Elder Tessa's original notes on In God We Trust. We can decipher this. Um, I'm not sure if I can. I, I, I can walk through some of it if you want. But one thing that I remember here is when she did this and I missed it, I don't know about all you guys, but I know I missed it. She put there way back in the beginning, if you see um, kind of in the center, not to the center, just to the left of the lines, the top line where it says one in God we trust, two, Bible history, specific days, and three, protection, discrimination, marriage, LGBT, Q, LGBT, and transgender. So she had LGB, LGBTQ, LGBT on the board, and it was something that I never, you know, processed it in my mind, and I don't know if anybody else did, but it was there all along, because this was done way back in 2019. Yeah. And I just, I thank God that I'm even here because I am very slow to understand what was laid out. Me too. It's like, there was a whole lot of information put upon us, but I couldn't process it until bulks of it was out there, if that makes sense. I, I wasn't processing it well, a piece at a time. Right. But I think that that's, you know, I'm, I'm surely that's the way God meant for it, because you look at Ezekiel and he talks about the wheels within wheels, and at first it looked like chaos. Well, that's kind of what was happening. It wasn't clear. And and then, you know, you get the bulk of that information out there, then your mind starts bringing it together and processing it. Right. Okay. Do you want to go over any other part of this? Oh, sorry. Um, she, well, she's got the Eula and the Hittikel. They're being showing, demonstrating two streams, right? Um, down in the, underneath where we were at, right underneath where right. we were at. Okay, and so then just to the left of that, you've got 79 to 89, the moral majority, which was Jerry Falwell and Liberty University. Um, 79, you dealt with racism and gender. 
1989, you have you go from Ronald Reagan to George Bush, and that's when they had the Christian Coalition. Then you had the Clinton Chronicles, 1994. Um, Mississippi, I'm trying to remember. Mississippi, I think, was the after 9-11, I think, is when they started to put In God We Trust back in the schools, I think it was. And I think it was in Mississippi where that began. And that was a progressive thing of putting um, In God We Trust and getting um, that all back in the schools. I think that culminated, I don't think that shows here, but in Arkansas. I don't see the Arkansas date on here. But um, And then we see in 2014, you have Steve Bannon, Cambridge Analytica. And they come up with the phrase, make America great again. Project Blitz um, in 2016. And 20, 2016 being that turning point we now know. And going to start to um, make America great again. And the great that they want is this being this white Christian nation. So then you have the top line. She, I think the reason she did it this way, I think anyways, is, is one continuous line, one continuous thread, but she broke it up by the, by the three histories. You know what I'm saying? She broke it up by the three histories. So you have it, the civil war at the top. Okay, and then you have midpoint is 1863. And that's where the... Um, the National Reform Movement was started, and you had prior to that, that's be the North was losing the war, right? And that Christian um, pastor, these 10 pastors wanted to, there was one in particular, I think, and it was 10 that actually did it. They um, wanted to put something on the coins. So that's when they developed the In God We Trust, and then they started to stamp it on the coins. And I think it's 1864, it says, yeah, they stamped it. I think she marks that, I think, as the, I think that says stamped. Yeah, stamped. Yeah. And then, um, and then the impeachment was Johnson, right? Andrew Johnson, is that, do I have the right name? After Lincoln died? I think so. Is that Andrew Johnson? Okay. I don't know why she has male pronouns written there. Another thing I missed, I'm sure. But then eight, and then the 19, there were several versions of this that had different dates and different events. This one shows 1948, 51, and 54, putting 51 as that midway point. You had in 48, um, putting under God, I think was, and this was introduced, I guess it says, what does it say, introduced into society? I'm not sure. And then the Knights of Columbus put it in their um, oath or something, in, in um, their salute. And then it became, then it went to the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag in, in, in uh, 1954. So this was an evangelical movement of, that, that took place. You know, they see the threat, they mobilize and, um, to get political power. So then in 1956, you have In God We Trust being put, I think, on the paper money there. Does this say A-M-R-E-V, like American Revolution here? It might. I'm not sure what that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it says introduced into society. Um, but then I know it was the Knights of Columbus first in 1951 that put it into their pledge. I think Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know what whatever they did, oath or pledge. And then in 54, it goes into the nation's Pledge of Allegiance. So Susan puts in here regarding male pronouns, she says, male pronouns in the constitution question mark. And she says the constitution's pronouns, we, they, he reveal use of the male pronoun and there's no she. In there. And then also she mentions the Mississippi, where was that? Um, right here. Mississippi down on our line, yeah. So in Mississippi, in God we trust and today Mississippi Dobbs versus Jackson women's health. Yeah, a lot going on in these states. I think of Texas as being one of those. Um, it's like a lot happens in Texas as well. You go back to um, back into this history that we're looking at in the leading up to American expansionism, with when they took Texas right, and then you look at what Texas did with abortion. It's like Texas is all over this these studies as well. With, with their activities, Mississippi as well. 
the states that lead out in this type of. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, she did put it up in the corner, top, kind of top left, just underneath in God we trust. For national reform equals national is nationalism, reform is make it great again. So this reform, this nationalism is make it great again. And Troy puts in slavery and sexism. In Texas, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Was Mississippi also a slave state? Yes, right? Yes. I'd have to look the, the map, but I'm pretty sure it was. Oh, it's confusing with Missouri, but yes, Mississippi. Susan said yes. Okay, thank you. Missouri was the dividing line. What do they call that? The isn't Missouri where because that's what the Missouri Compromise was about. Okay, so never mind. Okay, cool. Uh, so coming back to our line, the increase of knowledge of the Sunday law is 2019. Okay. Uh, and we've already said these waymarks are time periods, May to September for us. When did the increase of knowledge on the 144,000 line begin in 2019? When did the increase of knowledge of the Sunday law began? I would suggest it started in February. Does anybody remember that? That would be the In God We Trust studies in Brazil of 2019. So what did we see in February? February was the Brazilian camp meeting, and that's when I would mark the beginning of the increase of knowledge for the Sunday law. I would say February to August. You could say September. In August, what, were, what we were teaching is equality. It's reached that point, and we know there's no Sunday law. But I would suggest our understanding in February began to transform my, our idea of the Sunday law because what we were teaching at, because what were we teaching at, at that camp meeting? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember? It would be this. Yeah. What I find so fascinating is it didn't begin by taking us to slavery to change our idea of the Sunday law. That was August. In February, where did it take us? It took us to 1888, and it told us that Adventism, which is us, does not understand 1888 history. Most of that camp meeting, I was reading quotes of A.T. Jones showing that we did not correctly understand what he fought for. If Advent, Adventism, us, understood 1888, how would we have stood on gay marriage in 2015? That was all said in February. So this increase of knowledge is going to radically change our understanding of the Sunday law, not in the Adventist understanding that there is the structure, but what it looks like. So what did A.T. A. Jones fight for? He fought, fought for rights for everyone, not just his own religion, but for everyone. Yeah. Okay, so quote, Mr. Corliss, I reside in the city, sir, with my family. I speak in behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Washington, of which I am at present the pastor. As a citizen of the United States and as a resident of this district, I appear not as has been affirmed before you to speak in behalf of a Saturday Sabbath. Far from it, gentlemen of the committee. If this bill number 3854 were to have incorporated into it instead of Sunday or the first day of the week, the word Saturday or the seventh day of the week, there is no one who would oppose it stronger than I. So he was opposing any type of mandatory day, right? Because he was trying to keep 
the separation of church and state and make it equality for all. No favoritism, right, to any one particular group, right? God is going to begin that work by taking us to 1888 history, not to Millerite history, making the point in quote after quote that Adventism does not understand the external of 1888. We read the quote of A.T. Jones, who stood in Congress and said, if you were trying to propose a bill that defended the Saturday Sabbath, we would oppose it just as strongly as we oppose the Sunday law, paraphrase, okay? And that is not the approach that Adventism takes to government today, right? They don't, because they're trying to make it, force it. So our increase of knowledge of the Sunday law takes us to 1888. It was this increase of knowledge. It was not saying we understand 1888, but we've forgotten Millerite history. It was saying we don't understand 1888 and we forgot slavery. We didn't even know the Civil War was part of the great controversy. So we're having to go through this. What is really quite a step increase of knowledge? Steep. I'm sorry, steep. <laughs> steep step. What is really quite a steep increase of knowledge? Which is a big learning curve for my brain. Yeah, all of us, yeah. As we go into the study of this camp meeting, we're not going back to discuss Millerite history, slavery. We were trying to do that in May to September, but we kept getting redirected when we began looking at Jedediah Morse and the split within Protestantism. I want to give one example of how we misunderstand. As we get closer to the Sunday law, it stands out in more and more detail. Back here, okay, back here, it's okay to say that Protestantism will do something. As we get closer, the message refines that is far too broad a statement. So we have to know understand it better what it looks like yeah closer yeah and the closer we get kind of like that the previous study where all we understood from 1989 to 2016 was the king of the north pushes against the king of the south and then all that opened up as we got to that place we needed to understand it more clearly more detailed exactly an example what is your perspective of world Council of Churches. What I understand is that this World Council of Churches, a sign of the end times as Protestants came together with this deep state agenda to introduce a Sunday law into the United States. We ignore the split within Protestantism and the fact that many of these Protestants who would call themselves fundamentalists oppose the World Council of Churches, calling it too liberal. That this World Council of Churches is as evil to them as the UN. So they formed the International Council of Churches. So Adventism sees these liberal Protestants. They think we are going to oppose these liberal Protestants. We see the UN, we see the World Council of Churches. So we'll stand apart from that and we'll reject the UN and we'll reject the World Council of Churches. Instead of standing apart, all we did was align ourselves with conservative Protestantism. Who sees the great threat is globalism. The UN and the World Council of Churches. We have not stood separate to Protestantism. All we did was align ourselves with one stream of Protestantism. And like conservative Protestantism, we stand here looking at the liberals for the threat who we think will institute the Sunday law. This warped worldview, it's just repeating the mistake of ancient Israel. So we need to understand 1888 history and trace Protestantism 
back to the time of the end. We're going to do that particularly with the first document. We'll supplement this document with three other sources. The first source is the church and state in the early Republic. The second source we'll, we will supplement with will be some references to A.T. Jones. The third source is a book called The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America by Francis Fitzgerald. I have this as an audiobook. I don't have time to read, but as an audiobook, it's almost 26 hours and I have not finished. But it's a very in-depth look at Protestantism, particularly beginning in detail from the Second Great Awakening. It's titled The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America. It's difficult to reference an audiobook of that size, so you may find me just making statements of fact, such as Billy Graham was a fundamentalist, where I won't necessarily prove it because the laid out evidence is in a 26 hour audiobook. It's published in April of 2017, so it's particularly these three other reference materials we will use. There's also much more information in articles and YouTube videos. Just as a disclaimer, we, have, we will have to simplify. And whenever you simplify, people can get a little frustrated that they don't think you're going far enough to see the real picture. But I would suggest we always need to cut away the mud. However much we need to simplify, there's quite a simple and consistent thread that we are tracing. Can you pause right there for a second? Yeah. So just to answer a question that I got, just okay. looking at the line of the 144,000 there. Now we look at the line of the priests and what we've learned through fractals that in between each there's um, the, the hand of God. Well, even if you went to the great controversy line, which was 1798 all the way to the second advent, which that's up at the top, but it would be the hand of God, the, the five fingers, and you'd always have a middle way mark. So you have five way marks and four dispensations. Agricultural wise, it's plowing, former rain, latter rain, and harvest. But in between each dispensation, you always have the pattern, the repeating pattern of Boston, Concord, Exeter, which is a message arrives, then there's an increase of knowledge, then there's a formalization. So we saw that repeating pattern on all the fractals and for me, um, you know, I'm looking at this and thinking, I know I knew this, but for some reason or other, I'm not remembering it, but I knew I knew this because we taught this, or we've seen it taught and we've taught it. But on the line of the 144,000, you go from 9-11 um, to the Sunday law, which is the former reign on the line for the 144,000. So that whole big period from 9-11 to the Sunday law is the latter, uh, is the former reign. Um, but like in the repeating pattern, you're going to have as well an increase of knowledge and a formalization. And that increase of knowledge was 2019. She marks it February to February to August, the increase of knowledge when she began teaching in God We Trust um, in Brazil. And I don't remember where she marked it ending in August. But then we come, we continue to go through and on this particular line where we were at at that time, it shows us marked in between um, 2019 and 2021 in between the increase of knowledge and the formalization. So on that 144,000 line. So Panium then 2021 is the formalization of the Sunday law. So like in the last study, we were talking about um, how we've got that explosion of verse 40 opening up at the details just before you got to that um, close of probation. So we're coming up on the Sunday law here and you're having, we're having this explosion of information on verse 41 to prepare us for the Sunday law. So I hope that helped with that question. So the, so the, the same repeating pattern, Boston, Concord, and Exeter, you see on the 144,000 line with um, 2019 as the increase of knowledge and then 2021 as the formalization. Okay, and that helped. Okay, thanks. I know that that's 
I mean, I'm sitting here listening to this and thinking, I never really looked at it that way. And it's like I had to have because I put the notes together many times. <laughs> so I know I did. It's just probably my memory. So what question were you answering? What? What question were you answering? Oh, no, Susan asked me a question. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just figured if anybody else was having that problem, it'd be good to go through it. So what was the question? Um, about the, are, are we in the formalization? Where did it start with? Because it looks like we're overflowing now. I hope it's okay that I say this, Susan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can share it if you want. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> sorry, Susan. Um, oh, I didn't mean to go that direction. But she was asking about um, Panium. Mm -hmm. Go back to it. Okay. You, you said share it. It's okay if I share it, Chris, uh, Susan? You said, yeah, you, you can share it if you want. Thank you. Yes, okay. So the question was, are we already in Daniel 1141? And in many countries are the different states like Texas, Mississippi, et cetera. And one by one, these cultural state ideology will come in like a flood. But Daniel 41 is when you go to the world. So we're not in verse 41. That was, my, that was her question. We're not in verse 41. We're before verse 41, and we're in this period of time where we're seeing great light and the explosion of Daniel of, of verse 41 for Panion. I hope that made sense. Yes, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Susan. Sorry. Well, explaining the, these things along the way helps. It's uh, more insight. To me, it just helps lock it into my brain, which is yeah. I definitely need it. <laughs> so I'm going to summarize. And remember, when she summarizes, she's summarizing something she just already said. She's just not coming out and summarizing something out of the blue. So I'm going to summarize. We have been in the time of the end since 1798. It is a loaded history, and we have not realized how much of that history is the final struggles of the great controversy, the prophetic nature of those events, from the Civil War to World War II, to Reagan, who we can see more clearly. We're in the final events of the final events. God has brought modern Israel to the same point as ancient Israel. Adventism is failing in their Omega history. He has the people he's training. We stand headed, heading towards two formalizations. So remember the formalization for the priests, formalization for 144,000. That was back in 2020. We have been through the increase of knowledge. Uh, we have the formalization of the priests to come and the formalization of the Sunday law. As we approach the Sunday law, it's standing out with more and more clarity as God gives us different models to break down past history leading to future history. We looked at just three different models, Millerite, 1844, 14,000. What did I say? Sorry. Okay, so three different models, Millerite, 1888, and 144,000. The study of the counterfeit. Uh, but then it's the third model in God We Trust, showing us, regardless of what Adventism is doing, three Protestant movements from the 1860s, 1850s, and present. That's all in an introduction to the first document because this first document, the introduction, first page, third paragraph, this article illustrates the dynamics that transform, okay, this is a quote, I think. This article illustrates the dynamics that transform conflicts over national identity into constitutional conflicts by examining three movements in the longstanding debate over whether the United States should be understood as a Christian nation. The 19th century Christian amendment movement, mid 20th century Judeo-Christian nationalism, and the new Christian right that began in the 1970s 
and 80s. And that would be, um, I'm assuming, a quote from the evangelicals? It, from the article that she's talking about, uh, the Howard, uh, Jared Goldstein article. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. great. Okay, thank you. All right, that makes sense. Okay. I think that was actually the end and just back to the same board we started out. Um, oh, okay. was that it? Was that it or was it one more? Thing? Somehow I went backwards. So oh. uh, let's see. Oh no, no, I didn't. Okay. So we were here. I just I just read this one. We looked at the picture again. This, okay. this and then um, this is new. Okay, so we're on page 30. Um, so it's going to take us back to 1888 history, then the 1950s, and then present day. An external source perfectly validating our message. I want us to look into the author just for a moment. The author is Jared A. Goldstein. Professor Goldstein was one of the first civilian lawyers allowed to Guant Guantanamo Bay. He represented several Kuwaiti detainees in Guantanamo Bay. His involvement with those Guantanamo, Bay, um, Guantanamo cases, his defense of them led all the way to the Supreme Court. He's a national expert on habeas corpus. So he's a lawyer, a professor. He's particularly known through his, first, through his fight against Guantanamo Bay for the constitutional rights of several of the inmates. He's authored numerous briefs for the Supreme Court. He's nationally recognized. He regularly publishes in the highest um, law journals and he is a teacher of constitutional law. That's the status of the man who wrote how the constitution became Christian. This is not a law student writing for an exam. You go through the other articles he's written. In 2018, the Ku Klux Klan's Constitution. In 2018, another article, Unfit for the Constitution, Nativism and the Constitution from the Founding Fathers to Donald Trump. In that article, he's tracing nationalism from the beginning of the United States to Donald Trump. This article is from 2017. In 2014, the American Liberty League and the rise of constitutional nationalism. That was another article. In 2011, he's writing about the constitution and the Tea Party movement. We've discussed how the Tea Party led to Donald Trump. So he's written, that's just a few of them, some fascinating articles, and he's not someone unrecognized or untrained. He's defended constitutional rights through Guantanamo Bay all, all the way up to the Supreme Court. So we're going through his 2017 document, How the Constitution Became Christian. That's just our introduction to this document. Last year, we were given a model that looked at three evangelical movements. This document does the same. It looks at the same three mo movements, but it's going to expand our understanding of that history it's not enough to know there will be a Sunday law. Adventism stands on the train tracks looking for the World Council of Churches and the UN to do something and not realizing that conservative evangelicalism has had a 41 year head start while we were putting on our boots. If we want to understand this modern history, putting aside the 1950s Adventist no to lift up 1888, we should, so we should um, understand it. I don't think I read that right. Okay, so if we want to understand this modern history, putting aside the 1950s, Adventists know Adventist to lift up 1888, so we should understand it. We'll come back to this document in our next study. We'll go through certain portions and address each one of these three movements and add in some surrounding context. And that's it. That was fast. That's it, okay. So um, I'll go ahead and say the prayer. Um, if you'll kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, 
Thank you for how you have been opening our eyes. We see more clearly the curtain withdrawn in this great struggle. I pray, Lord, that we will see more clearly, not just the details, the facts of the matter. We will, may we not lose sight of the point of this war, the fight over a human soul and the value of that soul. May that cause each one of us to live and act correctly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.